Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, to the hearts of thy faithful. Kindle them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be free. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. God who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by that same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So a happy um, feast, at least um, in my diocese, we're celebrating Corpus Christi today. Um, and so um, happy Feast of Corpus Christi. And it doesn't, I, I didn't think about that when I scheduled this talk. Um, so it's actually the talk next time, um, two weeks from now, that relates more to the Feast of Corpus Christi. But we'll touch a little bit on it. So our topic for today is sacramental character. Um, and so what we're getting to um, is the, actually the third part of this series. And um, we started looking at um, what is a sacrament, why is it fitting? We looked at the matter and form the last two weeks that makes up the sign. And today we're gonna start looking at the effects of the sacrament. And the sacraments have two effects. Um, one effect that is um, grace, and we'll talk about that in two, um, not the next time, but the time after. We'll have two talks on the grace of the sacraments, sacramental grace. But in addition to grace, there's another effect of the sacraments, which is character, in the case of baptism, and confirmation and holy orders. And what we'll talk about next time something analogous, something similar in the other sacraments. Um, and this wasn't something that was immediately understood by the, the church. Um, it's something that, in fact, like so many other things that we're looking at in this lecture series, took centuries for um, the, the fathers and doctors to come to um, clarity about. That the sacraments, in addition to giving grace, give something else. And what we're going to look at today is they give an imprint of Christ on the soul, which we call character. Now, the way that, um, so St. Augustine, who is so important in sacramental theology, like so many other things, he would speak of the sacraments, above all, with regard to two things, the sacrament and what he called the reality of the sacrament, which is that um, effect that the sacrament produces in us, which is the effect of grace and sanctification. But the, um, and already that shows us that the sacraments are rich. They're not like other signs, right? Other signs, a stop sign, it's just a sign, nothing more, stop. Whereas the sacraments are efficacious signs. They do what they say, right? So all the sacraments have to have two levels, the sign, and the grace that it produces. But what we're gonna see in this talk is that even those two levels aren't enough. You need a third level, an intermediate level between the, the sign and the grace, which is in holy orders, sacramental character. And then two weeks from now, we'll look, well, what is that intermediate reality in the other four sacraments, the Eucharist, and penance, anointing of the sick, and matrimony, right? And theologians use a, a Latin phrase, race at sacramentum, sorry about the Latin, which means reality and sacramental sign, or reality and sign, to refer to this intermediate thing that's neither a visible sign, nor is it grace itself. Now let's take baptism. Baptismal, baptism imprints baptismal character, we'll explain that in a minute, which isn't yet the grace, but it's also not a visible sign. You can't see it, right? None of us, all of us who have been baptized have it, but none of us can see it looking at somebody else's face. So it's an invisible sign, which is weird, right? You think of signs being visible, like a stop sign. So let's first look at how did the church come to understand this? And then we'll look more um, systematically, what is it? Sacramental character. All right, so let's start with the Bible. What does the Bible say about this? 
and nothing directly. So here, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Okay. So the term character um, doesn't mean exactly what we use it to mean. Um, so when we speak about a person having character like a personality, character types, that's related. But what we're actually, we're using the word like in the sense of a character on a page, a written character. Um, and in scripture, we see this um, with regard to Christ. So Hebrews chapter one, verse three, speaks of Christ as the, um, so in English translation, the very stamp of the Father. He reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature, the Father's nature, upholding the universe by his word of power. But the Greek here is character. And what it means is stamp, image, seal. And the Father is sealed onto the Son in the sense that the Son bears the same nature, is from the Father. But that sets up analogy as Christ is the image of the Father, the perfect imprint, so he gives himself to us in the sacraments so that we get stamped also with his imprint. Right? So as the Son is the character of the Father, so we get the character of Christ imprinted on us. Right? And that's the glory of baptism, one of its glories, that we've got Christ's seal on us. And it's a, another term that's similar to character is precisely seal, spragis, spragis in, in Greek. Um, so seal, and the idea here is, think of an ancient, um, an ancient seal would be, um, for example, a king to mark his letters would have a seal with his image that would be imprinted on the letter. Um, and that seal would also mean that it hadn't yet been opened. Or likewise, every coin, a coin with an image, say, of the king, that would be a seal, right? and you would, can imprint many coins with the one seal. Um, now, in Scripture, again, we find that used of Christ. Christ, in the Bread of Life discourse, um, at the beginning, he says, so he's speaking to the people in Capernaum, in the synagogue, after the multiplication of loaves and fish, and he says that the people should seek not the food that perishes, but the food that endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. So again, the same idea as in Hebrews 1.3, that the Son has the seal of the Father, because yes, they're different in person, but they have that same divine nature. And Jesus mentions that at the beginning of the Bread of Life discourse, because he's going to give us his life. That's why he can give us the life, because he's the seal, as it were, of the Father. He has the, Father, and the Father's life imprinted on him, and so he can give that life to us. And then St. Paul uses this same idea of seal, more specifically with regard to confirmation, it seems. So in second letter to the Corinthians, chapter one, verses 21 and 22, St. Paul says, it is God who establishes us, and another translation there could be, confirms us with you in Christ, has commissioned us, that's the RSV, but a better translation would be, has anointed us. That's literally the meaning of the Greek word. He has put his seal upon us and has given us his spirit in our hearts as a pledge or guarantee. Uh, what is St. Paul talking about? It's not entirely clear. St. Paul is difficult, but it seems that he's speaking about the sacramental giving of the Spirit, which we call confirmation. And so he uses these four verbs to confirm or establish, to anoint, commission, to put his seal on us, and then the, gives his Spirit as a pledge. So in confirmation, you could think likewise in baptism, we, are, we receive the Spirit as a seal, as it were, on our soul. And so there's actually two effects of the sacrament given here. 
The Spirit gives us grace, but even if we lose grace, we still have this seal, which we'll see is indelible. It gets imprinted on us, and we can't strip it off afterwards. Right? For our glory, if we're faithful, but also for our shame, if we're unfaithful. Right? So this is the, the idea of um, baptismal or confirmation character. Christ has set his seal upon us. And he speaks about it also in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. In him you also, who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. And so we've been sealed um, with the Spirit. And again, when he traces out, first the word was preached, you believed, and then you were sealed. And so we can take this um, to mean both baptism and confirmation. Right? So after believing, um, the, uh, the neophytes recite the creed, they're baptized, and then they're given the spirit in confirmation. And so that's spoken of as being sealed. And likewise, in, later in the letter, fourth, chapter 4, verse 30, he says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. When? When we were baptized and confirmed. Right, for the day of redemption, meaning that on the last day in our judgment, that seal will be visible to all and will be judged by our fidelity to the seal. Colossians um, chapter 2, likewise, um, well, it doesn't speak about seal here directly, but about circumcision, which is a kind of physical seal on the flesh. Right? So the, in the Old Covenant, the right of initiation into the covenant, circumcision, is a kind of sealing, but to be sealed in the flesh itself. And so St. Paul makes a connection between circumcision and baptism and says, in him, in Christ, you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. You are buried with him in baptism you were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And so he's speaking here about baptism. And he's saying, in our being baptized, we were figuratively confer, uh, circumcised in Christ by being inserted into Christ. And we're inserted into his circumcision, as it were, which is a kind of seal. So St. Paul is, is playing here on the idea of a visible seal in the Old Covenant, circumcision, and an invisible seal in the new covenant, which is baptismal character, or the seal that gets imprinted on us invisibly in baptism and confirmation. The church. So they also make this same analogy of a seal, and they develop it more using the um, seals um, that were in place in the culture of their time. So a coin, for example. Clement of Alexandria, in the beginning of the third century, speaks about um, the Christian on the analogy of a coin. So he says the Christian has, so imagine a coin, but instead of having the, the president or the king's face on it, we've got the face of Christ and an inscription in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? So that's how we can think of what baptism does. It makes us coins, as it were. So the Christian has through Christ the name of God written on him and the spirit as an image. And then he makes another analogy to branding. So um, I guess in the, um, at the time, um, shepherds would mark their flock, their property, by branding the, um, the sheep or, or whatever it was, cattle, um, with the name of the owner. And so we too have been branded with the name of our owner. And that owner is Jesus Christ, but through Christ, also the Father and the Holy Spirit. And that's part of the meaning of baptism, precisely in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? It's the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit imprinting their identity and their ownership upon us. 
such that we're no longer our own after we've been baptized. Right? So it's a solemn thing. But it's the seal of truth. It's a glorious thing. Right? So we have the mark of Christ upon us. St. Augustine develops this in various homilies. Um, and he uses the example of a legionary. Um, so in the Roman legion at the time, not only animals, sheep would be branded, but the, the soldiers themselves would be branded, but it would be not a, a shameful thing like being branded you know, in a prison, but it would be branded with the glorious um, sign of one's legion that one was proud of. Right? And so um, the legionaries had a mark of their legion branded on their arms. And you couldn't get rid of it. That was the whole point of that brand. So if you, um, if you ran away, um, or worse, was it became a traitor, that mark would remain forever as a sign of um, treason. So Saint Augustine here is, uh, he says, he's speaking. Well, the context of this is in North Africa in the fourth and fifth centuries. There was a terrible schism. Um, such that the church was split into two groups, the Catholic Church and the Donatist Church, named after somebody named Donatus, who started the schism in North Africa. And so in every city, you had the Catholic Cathedral and you had the Donatist Cathedral, etc. And you had a Catholic bishop and a Donatist bishop. And they believed they weren't heretics in the sense that they had the same Catholic faith about everything. So it was more like the Eastern Orthodox, except one thing. They denied what we're talking about here, sacramental character. And so they thought that um, if you lost grace, you lost baptism. And so they were rebaptizing. Um, and they likewise didn't recognize holy orders if someone sinned gravely and they would reordain. And so they had a separate hierarchy and they didn't recognize the Catholic hierarchy. Right? And so you have this, this terrible schism. So St. Augustine is writing against them and he says, for those who possess the baptism of Christ, so suppose somebody had become a Donatist and then were to um, come back to Catholic unity. You wouldn't, St. Augustine wouldn't rebaptize them. He says, um, if they return to unity, we don't change or destroy their title, but we acknowledge the title of our king, the title of our commander. What are we to say? A wretched patrimony, let him whose title you bear, Jesus Christ, own you. You bear the title of Christ, do not be the property of Donatus. Um, it would be similar today if um, take some um, Christian sect that didn't recognize Christian baptism, right, and called themselves by the name of a man rather than by Jesus Christ. Um, that would be the analogy for what um, St. Augustine is doing here. So a seal, we should think that baptism, confirmation, and holy orders prints a seal on us that remains forever. Right? That's the idea. That's what they're trying to express with these various analogies. And it has three purposes. That's what we want to look at now. So what's the, why do we need a seal? And so the first thing is it gives us a new permanent identity. And again, I hope that the fruit of this talk is that we come to a greater appreciation of what happened to us in our baptism and confirmation. Right? So at baptism and confirmation, um, instead of being simply Larry Feingold, I've become now a member of Christ. And his identity has been imprinted on me such that my identity has fundamentally changed by being baptized. And my autonomy has changed, right? I'm no longer simply my own, right? Because I have this new identity, which is in Christ. Now, when Christ gives us a new identity, Christ has a mission, right? Christ came on earth with the mission of saving the world. And therefore, when he stamps his identity on us, what happens? We get a mission that's new as well. Identity and mission are inseparable. You can't get a new identity without getting a new mission in life. And now our mission is to redeem the world with Christ, to be a co-redeemer. And so here in Latin, 
and the tradition spoke of one being an alter Christos, that would be the new identity, another Christ and a co-redeemer sharing his mission. Now, the problem though is how can I do that mission? That mission is, is one proper to Jesus Christ, the incarnate word. And so he has to give us a power to share in that mission. And character imprints on us, um, in a way that I'll explain later, um, a power of, in fact, of two different kinds. It gives us a power to um, receive the other sacraments, baptism, or in holy orders, a power to administer other sacraments. And it's also a power in us to give grace, to give us the graces that we need to accomplish the mission. And we'll talk more about that in talks nine and 10 um, down the road. So the catechism speaks about sa the sacramental seal or character. I'm using them as synonyms, sacramental seal or character. And it says, by this anointing, so speaking directly of confirmation, by this, but it applies to baptism too, by this anointing, the confirmand, the person just confirmed, receives the mark, the seal of the Holy Spirit. And in fact, those are the words, um, receive the seal of the Holy Spirit that the bishop says in confirmation. So um, we celebrated, um, we weren't able to, I, I teach RCA at the cathedral in St. Louis, and we weren't able to have um, the um, people received at the Easter Vigil. So it was celebrated two weeks ago at uh, Pentecost. Yeah, three weeks ago. Yeah. And so th those are the words that the bishop says, receive the seal of the Holy Spirit. And so the catechism explains that a seal is a symbol of a person, a sign of personal authority or ownership. Hence, soldiers were, were marked with their leader's seal, slaves with their masters, and juridical acts or documents. Yeah. And so Christ declared that he was marked with his father's seal, as we saw. So Christians are also marked with the seal. And it goes to quote um, St. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It is God who establishes us with you in Christ, commissioned us, has put his seal on us, and given us his spirit. Right? The seal of the spirit marks our total belonging to Christ, our enrollment in his service forever as well as the promise of divine protection in the great eschatological trial, the trial against evil, right? the trial of the Christian combat. All right, so let's look, go back now to St. Augustine and the Donatist controversy. And for the beginning of how the church first came to understand that there is such a thing as um, sacramental character or, or the seal. And so it, it came up first with St. Cyprian, the third century. St. was Bishop of Carthage, great bishop, great doctor, doctor of the church, but he made a, a terrible mistake about this subject right here that we're looking at. So he thought that baptism um, could not be rightly, validly administered by heretics or schismatics. And so the heretical and schismatic sects of his time and he didn't recognize their baptism. So when they came into Catholic unity, he um, would rebaptize them. Or, and um, he came into conflict with the Pope at this time, whose name was Stephen I over this issue. And it's interesting that St. Cyprian was one of the great defenders of the primacy of the Pope. And he has a beautiful work called On the Unity of the Church, where he defends the primacy of the Pope but on this issue, he came into conflict with the Pope's authority, and he thought that he was right. And of course, the Pope also thought that he was right. And which one was actually right? The Pope. Um, both of them were basing themselves on tradition. Right? So the Pope was basing himself on the tradition in Rome, in which they didn't rebaptize heretics who um, returned to Catholic unity, but simply um, gave them the sacrament of penance and reconciled them. But in North Africa, um, 
there was a recent tradition, St. Cyprian thought it went back to the apostles, but in reality, it was just about 40 years old, um, a tradition of rebaptizing. Um, and so the problem here was Cyprian didn't know his history and we can't really fault him. He wasn't in a position perhaps to know that. Um, but in any case, they, um, so they, there was a series of letters between Cyprian and the Pope, which got very bitter and, and um, strident. And another persecution came up and both were martyred. And so both received the crown of martyrdom and the controversy came to an end, um, fortunately in that way. Um, St. Augustine, 100 years, 150 years later, continued the same controversy with the Donatists. So that at this time, sorry, this is a little complicated. The Donatist um, schism had taken up St. Cyprian's idea that um, sacraments administered by um, heretics or even people who were morally unworthy um, were invalid. And so they regarded Catholic sacraments as invalid because, um, again, it's, it's too complicated for us, but the history of it was during the time of the persecutions, some bishops had lapsed and then were reconciled and continued to administer sacraments. And the Donatists, and I'm probably butchering this, but in any case, the Donatists didn't recognize the Catholic hierarchy because they thought that they had been implicated in the um, giving in in the persecutions. Um, but the fact is that, and the sac we'll see later on, the sacraments don't depend on the moral worthiness of the minister, right? They depend on Jesus Christ who works through them. And so, um, so the Donatists didn't, um, yeah, they, they were rebaptizing if somebody they thought morally unworthy had baptized. And so St. Augustine um, defended the, the fact that baptism, um, as long as it's done with the right form, and the right manner, and the intention of doing what the church does, does what the church does through Christ working through it. And so it doesn't depend on the worthiness of the minister. Um, and you can't rebaptize someone who's been rightly baptized. Right? And so St. Augustine based himself likewise on um, the tradition, which he's thought to be um, rightly from the apostles. And he applied this to, to baptism, but also to holy orders. Um, so if somebody um, was ordained and then um, went, to, let's say, into a, a heretical or schismatic sect and then came back to Catholic unity, they weren't reordained. They simply would um, receive reconciliation, right? But holy orders like baptism imprints a seal that's indelible, that can't be lost, that um, infidelity doesn't take away. And from, the, from this, St. Augustine deduced that baptism abides even when grace is separated from it. So here's the thing we wanna look at. So he deduced from the fact that there's only one baptism, that you don't get rebaptized or reordained if you've become unfaithful and then um, get reconciled. He inferred from this that there must be something more to baptism than simply the outward sign that passed away. Right? So the, when we were baptized, the actual outward sign takes place in a few seconds. Right? Water is poured and words are said that take 10 seconds. But the effect um, endures even if grace itself is lost. And so here's the, the difficult thing. We can speak of sacraments being um, fruitful or unfruitful. A sacrament is unfruitful if I lose the grace. But it can still abide even though I don't have the grace that it ought to give. Right? So somebody who's been baptized, who's not faithful to their baptismal promises, lives in mortal sin or um, is culpably um, an apostate or something. And baptism still abides even though the grace isn't there. And so that's what shows us 
that there's this intermediate effect that is the seal um, or the character of baptism. And, and so you can't rebaptize somebody, you just simply take away the obstacle that was stopping baptism from having its effect. Right? So we can block the action of the sacraments by not being rightly disposed to receive their fruit. And that the, the necessary disposition is that we believe and are repentant for the sins that we're aware of. Right? And so we can block the fruitfulness of the sacraments by culpably lacking faith and not repenting. But when that's the case, it doesn't annul baptism or annul confirmation or annul holy orders. It just puts a, an obstacle, like a wall, between the sacrament that abides and its fruit. And as soon as we take away that obstacle, the fruit comes back. It comes back to life. All right? So let's take an example of this. Um, let's take um, an RCA. Somebody goes through the RCA program, um, but they're in a state, let's just suppose, they're in a state of mortal sin. They have some habit that they're aware of, of grave sin, and they don't resolve to break with it. They get baptized, what happens? They're truly baptized, if they have intended to be baptized, but that lack of repentance for that habit of sin that they want to remain in blocks baptism from having its effect of grace. Let's suppose some time goes by and they repent of that, go to confession, that obstacle is now taken away and baptism will bear its fruit. Right? And the same thing goes for confirmation, right? This happens probably not infrequently. Not, probably not, I mean, tragically, we hope not, but not a few probably of the teenagers who are confirmed are confirmed perhaps with habits of grave sin that they don't, they haven't, don't have repentance of in which case they're truly confirmed, but it won't be fruitful until they take away that obstacle. Right? And the same thing happens for holy orders. A priest, let's say a priest falls into grave sin. Right? That blocks holy orders from bearing its fruit of grace in the priest's life at that time. But as soon as he repents of it, then the grace comes back. But he never lost holy orders, and thus his administration of the sacraments all of it remains valid. We'll look, we'll look at this again later on when we look at what's meant by the term ex opere operato. That's precisely what we mean, that the sacraments work from the work done and not from the holiness of the minister. So the fact that the minister is in a state of grace or a state of mortal sin doesn't affect the, um, the sacrament that he administers. In fact, same. Look now at Thomas Aquinas. So Thomas Aquinas um, has an, a question on sacramental character. And as far as I know, no, he's the one. Um, so maybe let me take a step back. St. Augustine got the idea of sacramental character. Uh, he's, he's the one who identified there's this third thing, this seal that remains even when a person loses the state of grace. Um, and sometimes he speaks of it as character, using the analogy of the, the legionnaire, who has the character of his legion on his arm. So St. Augustine is the one who really came up with the term and the idea. But um, it's really eight centuries later with the scholastics that there began to be a serious reflection on and a technical term, sacramental character, that everyone began to understand. All right, so it's in the 12th and 13th century that this doctrine gets worked out. And yeah, St. Thomas Aquinas is the one who um, most successfully does so. Um, and so he, he asks what, so he says the sacraments have two different effects, grace and character, or let's take um, in the Eucharist. So today we're celebrating Corpus Christi, at least in St. Louis here. And um, the, um, it's the feast that honors the real presence of Christ. That too is an intermediate thing. So the outward sign of the Eucharist is the bread and the wine and the words. Right? That's the sacramental sign. 
the grace of the Eucharist is building up the unity of the church. Right? So the unity and holiness of the church, Christ's life in us, that's the reality of grace. But there's something in between. And that thing that's in between is Christ's real presence, his body and his blood really present in the sacrament. Right? And that's where we get this term, race at sacramentum. It's a, it's a reality, which mean, is the meaning of race. And yet it's a sign of something further. It's a sign of the grace that the sacrament gives. And so something similar happens in baptism, confirmation, and holy orders. There's this intermediate thing, except it's not Jesus Christ as in the Eucharist. It's Jesus Christ's imprint. And so in the Eucharist, you've got the outward sign, Jesus' body and blood, and then the grace of his life that he gives to us. In baptism, we've got the outward sign, we've got the grace of baptism, and in between, we've got not Christ himself, but Christ's imprint stamped on our soul. Okay. And so St. Thomas analyzes it, and basically with three ideas, that first and foremost, it's an, an identity. We're stamped with the identity of Christ. So he says it's a sign conferring on a man a likeness to some principal person. So he's speaking in general. As soldiers are marked with, for military service. as um, And so in this way, Christians are, are deputed, are sent on the mission to engage in Christian worship, of which Christ is the author. And they receive a character, a mark or seal, by which they are likened to Christ. So it is Christ's character. Right, stamped on our soul. And this, right, this separates, so first thing that it does is it separates Christians from those who aren't in Christ. So it's a distinguishing mark by which those who are in Christ and uh, enter into Christ's mission are distinguished from others. And in that sense, it's similar to what circumcision did. Right? So circumcision marks the members of the Old Covenant out from the rest of mankind. Right? And it makes us a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Again, just as circumcision did in the Old Covenant. But because it does that, it gives us this mission. And the mission, St. Thomas explains, is to share in Christ's priestly mission. Right? So Christ became man precisely to be our mediator to be the perfect, and that's the meaning of a priest. A priest mediates between God and mankind, offering sacrifices for sin, right, and winning God's blessing. So Christ is the one perfect mediator. But since his image is printed on us, we too come to share in his priestly mission, right? And it's in this sense that all Christians are priests, priests not in the ministerial sense, but this is what we call the common or royal priesthood of the faithful. And again, this glorious dignity to share in Christ's priestly mission. And it's, St. Thomas only speaks here about the priestly mission, but we can say it's also the prophetic, Christ is prophet, king, and priest. Right, prophets, priest, and king. And we too, through baptism and confirmation, have been stamped such that we share in his priestly mission, but also his prophetic, and kingly mission, right? So that's what character is, we could say. A stamp that gives us this share in his priesthood, and therefore a share in his glorious mission, but also his incredibly difficult mission, his arduous mission to redeem the world and to fight against Satan and conquer. Right, so that's, but again, we need a power, right? So God never, so this is a very comforting axiom in the spiritual life. When God gives us a mission and he gives us a mission way above what we would ask for, when he gives a mission, he doesn't ever um, neglect to give us the power to accomplish the mission. But this power is twofold. It's partly a power to make use of the sacraments, that would be baptism and confirmation, or a power to administer sacraments, holy orders, and it's a power to receive the graces that we need as long as we don't pose the obstacle of unrepentance. 
right? So the sacraments um, give us identity, mission, and power. And a, a power precisely to give, to be the source of the graces that we need. And I'll explain that more two talks from now um, in chapter, talks nine and 10. And this imprint is indelible in the three sacraments that can't be repeated, right? And again, how do we know that the imprint is indelible? Precisely because baptism can't be repeated, confirmation can't be repeated, and holy orders, likewise. But um, St. Thomas makes sense of this. Why is it that it's indelible? And he says it's indelible basically because Christ is faithful, right? Christ's priesthood is eternal. We speak of him as eternal high priest. And so when his priesthood gets stamped on us, his very fidelity is part of the stamp. And so that's why it's an indelible mark. And so St. Thomas explains here, Christ's priesthood is eternal. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, Psalm 110. Consequently, every sanctification worked by his priesthood is perpetual, right? When Christ sanctifies something, consecrates it, that consecration lasts as long as the thing consecrated. Yeah. So even a church or an altar, and you don't re-consecrate it unless it's been profaned or destroyed. And that's true also of the, the human being, right? Since our soul is eternal, it can't get destroyed. And therefore Christ's consecration remains. What we can do is be unworthy of it um, by falling into mortal sin but the, the stamp remains. And then, right, another way to think of this is that Christ's, so in the sacraments, we get this um, stamp, which remains, but also grace. Now grace can be lost. And the reason for that is grace depends on our free will. God gives grace never irresistibly. Right? That's a Calvinist idea, right? The part of the two irresistible grace. But in reality, when God gives grace to us, a share in his nature, he gives it to us such, in such a way that we can cooperate with it if we're, if we're at the age of reason. And that we have to cooperate with it. And, and so therefore, we can not cooperate and lose grace. But character is different because character doesn't, Character makes us his instruments. And um, that doesn't depend on our will, but his. Right? So that's why character can't be lost. So again, take holy orders. The priest in being ordained becomes Christ's instrument. He can make himself unworthy for the task and lose grace because that depends on his free will. But he can't cut away his being Christ, made Christ's instrument. Again, that's what's so solemn about ordinations, as like baptisms and confirmations. This is how it is that a sacrament can come back to life, as I explained before, right? If somebody um, is baptized, but not in, without repentance, um, that baptism, the, the seal, the character remains, and that is what and will bring, be the cause of the grace as soon as a person takes away the obstacle of um, lack of repentance. And the same thing goes for um, sacraments that we'll talk about in the next talk, matrimony and, and anointing the sick. And right? so if, um, if a couple, if let's suppose one of the couple, um, one of the spouses is not in a state of grace at the, at the celebration of the sacrament, Right? The sacrament, they're truly married. The sacrament doesn't depend on the couple being in a state of grace. But the fruitfulness of the sacrament does. Right? So if I'm not in a state of grace, I'm putting an obstacle for receiving the sacramental graces to sanctify marriage. But marriage remains. And as soon as I take away that obstacle, the sacrament comes back to life. Right? So the same thing happens with baptism confirmation, and holy orders.
And this also explains how it is that the sacrament can give graces throughout our life, right? So we're baptized only once. And yeah, it took a minute, let's say, to be baptized, or maybe a few minutes. Um, but we're baptized for life. And that sacrament received it in a minute bears fruit over, let's say, however many years, 70 years, 90 years. Um, and it's able to bear fruit over time because something remains. And that which remains is the seal, right? the, the sacramental character. And so it remains not just simply as a kind of, um, not as an ordinary sign, but precisely as an efficacious sign. So there are two levels of sign here. Right? There's the outward sign that we can see, and that would be water poured on our head, right? I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the outward sign. But there's an inward sign, being baptized, having Christ's imprint, and that is just as powerful as the words, but with this difference that those, that we can think of it as an invisible word, our baptism, that continues to resound every day of our life. And in resounding, pulls down graces for us as we need them to accomplish the mission of baptism, which is to die to sin, right? To die with Christ, to sin, and to rise to new life in Christ. And the same thing for confirmation. Right? That confirmation takes a minute. Right? The bishop anoints the forehead, receives the seal of the Holy Spirit over in a flash, but that word gets imprinted and continues to speak for the whole of our life. Right? And so this explains how the sacraments can bear fruit um, over a huge stretch of time. The sacrament abides. And it's also this that makes the, again, the outward sign is gone in a minute. But Christians, so it's like, again, circumcision. And it takes a short time to circumcise, but the sign of circumcision remains throughout life. So that's analogous. It's just that the difference there is that's a mark on the flesh and baptism leaves a mark on the soul. Right? And likewise, confirmation. Likewise, holy orders. And that makes the church, we could say, visible. All right, not directly. I can't see your character. But that's why we keep baptismal records carefully. Right? Every pastor has to keep the baptismal records of all those baptized and confirmed and married in his church. Because um, it's through that outward sign that we know that this invisible seal remains that um, makes up the... Um, the members of the church and their hierarchical place in the body. Okay, all right, so this doctrine got worked out in the, we could say, first with the Father St. Augustine, it got clarified with the, with the doctors in the 13th century, and then it got defined by the church as a dogma of faith at the Council of Trent. And the reason for the definition was that the reformers, so Martin Luther, John Calvin, denied the existence of sacramental character. And, and so because of that, Trent um, defined it with these words. If anyone says that in the three sacraments, baptism, confirmation, and orders, a character is not imprinted on the soul, that is a kind of indelible spiritual sign by reason of which these sacraments cannot be repeated, let him be anathema. Now, Luther and Calvin um, didn't, they recognized that baptism could only be given once, whereas some of the, um, the more radical Reformation, the Anabaptists, were rebaptizing. But all of them denied the, we could say, uh, the doctrine that, that baptism leaves this, this second effect, in addition to grace, of um, sacramental character. But it was more important their denial with regard to holy orders, because um, Luther and Calvin denied the very sacrament of holy orders. And so Trent had to define that separately. So here, here's that. Since in the sacrament of orders, Trent says, as also in baptism and confirmation, a character is imprinted that can be neither erased nor taken away, the holy council justly condemns the opinion of those 
who say that priests of the New Te Testament have only a temporary power. Right? So for Luther, holy orders was um, a kind of function that um, enabled one to preach, but it was a function ultimately given by the community and um, could be given for a time. But um, Trent says, no, it's not a temporary power, but um, it's an indelible mark. Right? It can be neither erased nor taken away. And therefore, those who've been rightly ordained um, cannot become laypersons. Right? So, the, so we speak of somebody being laicized. But what that simply means is that a priest who has been found guilty of certain crimes can no longer lawfully exercise the, the rights and ob, uh, obligations of holy orders. But they still are a priest forever. And so you can't strip that away. All right, so let's look now in the remaining time at the difference between the three characters, baptism, confirmation, and holy orders. And so how do they differ? And why do we get three of them? Why not just one? Um, so that's a good question. Um, and again, like all things in theology, we have to, we know that, in other words, it's first a fact. We know that there are these three sacraments, basically because of the practice of the church of baptizing only once, confirming only once, and, and conferring holy orders only once at each grade. And, and so we know that these three, but why three? And what's the difference between them? And so here, this is theological reflection. St. Thomas gives a, a, a fine analysis of the difference between the character of baptism and confirmation. So he, he compares it to, um, a, so baptism is the sacrament of spiritual birth. Right? And so baptism, um, by um, what baptismal character does is it makes us members of Christ. So thus members of the church open to receiving the privileges of the body. And those privileges of the body are the other sacraments. So baptism gives the power to share in Christ's worship and to share in the power um, of sanctification of the other sacraments. Whereas confirmation is the sacrament of growth to spiritual maturity, and we could say spiritual movement and activity. The spirit is given to us to be an active member. And thus, the confirmation gives a different mission, right? So if the mission of baptism is to be a member of Christ, the mission of confirmation is to be an active member, and therefore a share properly in Christ's threefold active mission of prophet, priest, and king. Now it's true, we speak about that already with baptism, that in baptism we become a share of Christ's threefold office, but it's really principally in confirmation. Confirmation deepens that imprint of Christ so as to make us an active member. It's like the difference between a baby in a family. Um, so a baby gets inserted into the family, but the baby has to receive. It's true, the baby gives just by his being, but he can't usefully uh, set the table and make dinner and, and things like that, um, earn a salary. Um, And so maturity, oath to maturity, enables us not only to receive, but to give, and thus to share in the active mission. So, so that's how St. Thomas explains the new mission of confirmation. It says, in baptism, he receives the power to do those things that pertain to his own salvation. Whereas in confirmation, he receives power to do those things which pertain to the spiritual combat with the enemies of the faith. And then he looks at Pentecost, right? So Pentecost is the the time when the apostles were confirmed, as it were. And it changed them, right? It changed their mission. So before Pentecost, yes, they were praying in the upper room, but they weren't yet going out and evangelizing. Right? That all changes on the day of Pentecost. And so what it worked in the apostles, Pente um, what Pentecost did in the apostles, confirmation does in each one of us. It gives us that new mission. Now, we may not comply with the mission, we may not live as though we'd received that mission, but all of the confirmed have been given this new mission to no longer live for themselves or even their own salvation, but to live for the salvation of others, right, of the whole mystical body.
so let's so i think it's best to think of the um baptism and confirmation together giving us this um, we could say twofold um identification with christ to be in him and to share in his active outward mission with regard to others and this is the great dignity and calling of the laity so vatican ii one of its great um, accomplishments was highlighting the universal call to holiness which is rooted in our baptism and confirmation and our call to share in the church's mission again that would be the the common priesthood or royal priesthood of the faithful rooted in baptism and confirmation so there's a beautiful chapter um, 34 of lumen gentium of the second Vatican council speaking about this mission of the lay faithful right? so they've been dedicated to christ and anointed by the holy spirit so that's confirmation and they are marvelously called and the call is that all their works prayers apost apostolic endeavors right but also their ordinary married and family life their daily occupations their physical and mental relax i love that so not just you know our apostolic work of doing things like i don't know the association of human catholics and giving lectures like this but our relaxation our um, family life daily occupations um, everything if carried out in the spirit and even obviously the hardships of life if patiently born all of these become spiritual sacrifices acceptable to god through jesus christ together with the offering of the lord's body they are fittingly offered in the celebration of the eucharist thus as those everywhere who adore in holy activity and again a beautiful phrase who adore this holy activity can be going to work it can be having dinner it can be all of our friendships and relaxations and the lady consecrate the world itself to god and so that's the limitless nature of this mission given through baptism and confirmation. And um, this was one of the major legacies of the Second Vatican Council. And John Paul II saw it as his principal mission as Pope after the Council to implement um, the Council, and in particular, the universal call to holiness and the, um, the mission of the lay faithful um, in that universal call to holiness and to, um, to share in Christ's mission. So he has a beautiful document, um, the Apostolic Exhortation, Christi Fidelis Laici, on the, um, and especially number 14, he speaks about the way in which the lay faithful share in Christ's uh, prophetic, kingly, and priestly mission. And what's really interesting is they're not three separate things, right? So that would be a mistake to think, well, all right, here's my prophetic mission over here, my kingly mission over there, and my priestly mission. They all go together because it's the same. So the prophetic mission is giving witness. All right, how do we give witness principally? Through our life. And what does that mean? That means what we do in um, ordering our own life, our family, um, work, society. In other words, basically, what, all of those things that we're called to sanctify in ordinary life, that's our kingly mission. It's a mission of service and right ordering. And it's precisely that, that is prophetic, right? In other words, if I, so if we start with the kingly mission, the right ordering of things in service and love, it's that which gives witness more than speeches, more than talks. And then it's precisely that which we offer in the Eucharist, which is our prophetic mission. So the three missions are really one, right? And it's precisely to um, the imitation of Christ, in the whole of life yeah so there's a beautiful explanation in john paul i'm going to skip this though because we're running out of time here yeah. but it's basically reached work our call is to restore creation to its original value and we do that by living and um, we can't do that by ourselves right in other words simply it seems odd um, because you you might think all right if i just by willpower, try to stop um, sinning, I can restore creation to its original life. We, all of us know we can't do that, right? We'll immediately fall on our face. And so we can only restore creation to its original value by the aid of grace, by being restored and inserted into Christ, and above all, having the Holy Spirit 
be the principal mover. Right? And that's why the gifts of the spirit given in confirmation are absolutely essential to this prophetic, kingly, and priestly mission. Right. And so it's a glory. It's a glory that we're not enough. So, so much, I think, of the new evangelization has to be a wake-up call to the dignity of being made a share in Christ's priestly mission. I've given you here a quote from an Orthodox um, author, Afanasiev, um, a book called The Church of the Holy Spirit. Um, and so this would be something that we have totally in common. And um, the idea of the grandeur of this priestly mission that we've been given in baptism and confirmation. So he says, we are not aware of how extraordinary and audacious the idea of the priestly ministry, it's the common priesthood of all the members of the churches. And it's something, it's a vocation um, that we, we all share, but we're all doing it in a different way because we do it in the place where God has put us with the gifts that God has given us. So we could, I mean, so here would be the examination of conscience, right? All of us put great effort into our professional um, yeah, formation, education, our careers, but do we put the same care into the development of our priestly vocation, right? Which is, we could say, the vocation of vocations. Right? And that needs to be nurtured, and it's nurtured by prayer and the sacraments. And being aware, calling on, in other words, we were baptized and confirmed once, but it gives us a series of graces that we can call upon throughout our life. Right? But we forget to call you know, and make use of that. So one last thing, how does the, this common priesthood differ from the ministerial priesthood? So they're both truly priesthoods, we could say, in the sense of um, mediation. But the difference is they differ not, so the key text here is from the Second Vatican Council, Lumen Gentium 10. So it's a famous text, a beautiful text, where it says that they differ, the common priesthood of the lay faithful and the ministerial priesthood of the ordained, they differ in essence and not only in degree. So it would be a mistake to think, all right, the priest is just simply a little holier because he's gotten this extra priesthood. Um, but no, it's something different in kind, essentially different, and um, not simply in degree. But nevertheless, they're deeply, profoundly interrelated. The ministerial priest, by the sacred power he enjoys, acts in the person of Christ. He makes present the Eucharistic sacrifice and offers it to God in the name of all the people. So that's what's proper. The, the ordained priesthood enables those who receive it to act in the person of Christ and therefore to have a power to administer sacraments that by nature none of us have. Right? So none of us by nature has the power to take bread and wine and turn it into body and blood, the body and blood of Christ. No one has that power by nature except God. But every ordained priest receives that power in a stable way through priestly character. And it's the power to act in the person of Christ and therefore to say his words with his power. So his words body do what they say, which is proper to God and the God man, but not proper to any other human being. And so what's what Holy Orders does is that it enables those who receive it to act in the person of Christ, right? So that's what's proper to them. But the faithful, we also offer the Eucharist, but in the way that I said before, we offer the Eucharist by offering our own lives, our own sacrifices, precisely that even that mental and spiritual relaxation, bodily relaxation done in the Lord, um, all the aspects of ordinary life except sin, Right? We also bring to the Eucharist and join it to him. But there's a difference, right? What the priest makes possible is Christ being on the altar and the offering of Christ, the Son, to the Father. What we bring is our own lives. And you see, both are necessary. No priest is a priest for themselves. They're a priest so that they can make Christ present on the altar so that the whole church can gather around them and offer the whole of our lives to the Father with Christ. But without the priest, we can just offer ourselves, but we wouldn't be able to offer Christ. And so 
the, the priesthood of the faithful to offer our lives with Christ is only made possible if there's the ministerial priest who can make Christ present by acting in Christ's own person. So we're absolutely equally and mutually dependent on one another. Right? And this is why the lay faithful have to pray so much for our priests and support them and um, pray for vocations and their f continued fidelity. Because without them, the church can't make um, her offering with Christ. But again, the priest is not a priest for himself, but for others. Skip this. Um, I'm going to skip now to the yeah the Trinity. So just a concluding idea. Um, sacramental character has this beautiful Trinitarian dimension, and we can see that from baptism. What happened when Jesus was baptized by John? Right? There were words heard from the Father, you are my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased, and then the Holy Spirit descended on him. And what happened, therefore, in Jesus' baptism is a sign of what happens in all of our baptism. And it's also the reason why baptism is celebrated in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's a Trinitarian event, and it makes a new relation with each of the divine persons. Right? So when we're baptized, we get a new relation First of all, to the Son, right? Because we get inserted into the Son. But that makes us sons of the Father, like Jesus, so that we can hear those words, you are my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. So we get a new relation to the Father, as well as to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, because the Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son, and is the Spirit of Christ. And so if we're inserted into Christ, it's, and this is why it's fitting that baptism and confirmation be celebrated together insofar as possible, right? And that's why in the RCA, you have to receive baptism, confirmation, and the Eucharist together to show that um, being inserted into Christ and the Trinity logically implies receiving the gift of his spirit. Yeah. But nevertheless, we could say confirmation deepens what was begun in baptism, right? And it gives, we could say, a new relation because it gives a new mission. It's the same it's being inserted in Christ, but now being inserted into Christ as an active participant in his sanctifying mission, in his co-redemptive mission. And therefore we have a new relation to him and to his father, and we have greater need of his spirit to move us in that. And if that's true of baptism and confirmation, it's even more true of holy orders. And so in holy orders, again, there's a new relation to Christ because the, the priest, let's say holy orders, the level of priesthood, because the priest now is given to act in the person of Christ. And that makes a new relation to the Father, because he's, and this is why we call priests Father, because through administering the sacraments, they become fathers, as it were, of the faithful. In other words, they exercise a parental role of engendering life and of giving the divine life through the sacraments, right? And that's why. We, Again, why they receive this na beautiful name of Father. And, and, but they can't do that without a new empowerment of the Holy Spirit, who is the life giver. Right? So again, there's a new relation to the Holy Spirit. And that's why at the decisive moment of ordination. So recently, um, we've been celebrating ordinations in this season. So um, not long ago, there was an ordination in, um, at the cathedral in St. Louis and different parts of the world. And the essential part of them, so there are two parts to the right, the laying on of hands, and then a prayer said by the bishop. And that prayer invokes the power of the spirit, at three different grades, um, diaconate, priesthood, and, and, and episcopate, to give the power of the spirit to accomplish the mission. And so in summary, this doctrine of sacramental character, at first sight, it might seem like a technical thing, um, but it's a, a, a beautiful um, doctrine, a solemn one, but also consoling. Solemn in this, that it's indelible. And so the very fact that we've been marked forever, very often as babies, all right, so I was baptized 29, I had some say in it, but, but for a baby, they're marked, again, with a glory that is indelible. And it's solemn 
because we'll be judged by it. Right? So in our particular judgment, in the last judgment, um, our judgment will be, have we lived up to the image we received at our baptism that got deepened in confirmation through the power of the Holy Spirit and not simply through our own power. But the consoling part is that we're given the power to do this by the sacrament itself and we can always call on it. So throughout our lives, we ought to be calling on it. And so this is maybe the most amazing thing. Other seals, so here's where the analogy breaks down. Take a coin. The seal imprinted on a coin is static. That seal never changes. It just, over time, it gets worn down. But at baptism and confirmation, we've been given a seal that's dynamic. In the sense we've been imprinted with Christ, the, we could say the blueprint of Christ, but it's a blueprint that needs to be fleshed out in real life, in a life of charity. And therefore, over time, we're called to, how should we say, to, to live up to that image that's been stamped on it and to unleash its power over time. Right? So it's a blueprint of what we're called to be. But it's, again, not a static blueprint, but it's like a blueprint that can build the house if we only let it. And we let it by not posing obstacles and by desire, desiring it to be built in us. And of course, therefore, by prayer, which is the expression of our desire. All right, so let's pray that we never forget to call upon the grace of our baptism and confirmation and for priests who are listening, holy orders, so that that blueprint may be ever more realized in our life. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you. So let's take a little break and then we'll do questions. So as usual, you can write out your questions in the chat feature or, or ask them orally after. Some good questions here. So this one's um, from Jeannie Bateman. A friend of mine said that there were possible irregularities about her son's baptism. So he was provisionally rebaptized. What does this mean exactly? Um, I'm not sure actually what was meant there, but the, the reasons in general why baptism might not be um, valid are um, if it was, um, so we, it's what we did in the last two um, talks. You need to have the right matter and form and then the intention, um, um, the right subject to minister. So um, for baptism, there were um, certain churches in the, uh, after the council that because of radical feminism were baptizing not in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but in the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. And that was to avoid using the, the male pronouns and the, the male words for yeah, father and son. And, and so that would be an invalid baptismal formula. And then I just um, was in conversation with um, someone who's interested in becoming Catholic, and he said that he was baptized in the name of Jesus, which apparently is like done with, in certain evangelical uh, free churches. And, and so, if there's uncertainty about the baptismal formula, somebody can be conditionally baptized. So you don't say rebaptized, because if if you were baptized the first time, nothing happens now, right? So a conditional baptism is when you're uncertain whether a person is in fact baptized or not. And, and sometimes this comes up in RCA. So I've been teaching RCA, and um, so there are a few times where people have been uncertain about whether they were baptized uh, validly, in which case you would do um, a conditional baptism. And it's just, it's very simple. You just simply baptize and either mentally or out loud, you say the words, if you're capable, I baptize you. Yeah. Or if you haven't yet been baptized, I baptize you. And you would say it out loud to avoid scandal so that people don't think we're doing baptism a second time. Um, and you can also conditionally baptize if you're not sure, suppose you're at the scene of an accident. And um, so a catechumen who is in a car accident. Um, so if you're uncertain if they're alive, you would baptize them conditionally. I baptize you if you're capable of receiving this. Yeah. And it, um, yeah, so uh, for, and 
and so the same thing applies to other sacraments. You can add um, an implicit condition um, to anointing the sick. Same thing. Somebody's in, you're not sure if they're still alive, right? You can anoint them conditionally. Um, yeah, so it's simply to, um, with regard, or, uh, yeah, so Bob's question, when did a conditional baptism become a practice? Are there other, con so I think from, I mean, early on in the church, um, this question would come up. Um, are there other conditional, yeah, so the doctrine applies in general. It's just that you wouldn't ever, it wouldn't come up for the Eucharist. Um, but, um, um, and again, in confession, there can be a doubt in a priest's mind whether a person really has contrition. Um, in which case, he simply gives the absolution. And if I don't have contrition, nothing has happened. Um, and then in matrimony, sure, if a person is not, in fact, able to marry this other person because a prior bond exists, then it will be invalid. But you wouldn't use it, I mean, you wouldn't do a conditional matrimony. So it really comes up mostly with um, baptism, confirmation, and um, could come up with holy orders yeah, also. So Anglicans who, um, an Anglican or Episcopal pr priest who becomes Catholic and gets the, um, and becomes then ordained as a Catholic priest, that wouldn't be a conditional ordination, but would simply be an absolute ordination because we would recognize the previous uh, Anglican ordination as invalid. But if, again, if you had a doubt, than there could be. Another question from Todd. When a priest poses an obstacle and grace is not unleashed such that the sacrament of holy orders is not fruitful, in what way is it not fruitful? Since we know that it is at least able to be fruitful in confecting the Eucharist and unleashing that grace for others. Yes, that's right. So it's, um, as long as someone is validly ordained, they receive through the character, priestly character, the power to um, confect the other sacraments and that therefore to, um, to consecrate the Eucharist, to absolve in um, reconciliation. Now you also need, I'll, you need jurisdiction to validly uh, hear someone's confession and absolve. But in danger of death, any priest who's been validly ordained can do that. And so, yes, that's never blocked by the priest falling into sin. But what's blocked is the sacramental graces that will help make him a better minister. And that's, yes, yeah, so it doesn't, the, the sacraments work from the work done and not from the holiness of the minister. But the holiness of the minister is gigantic for the mission of the church, right? And this is why the priestly scandals of recent years and throughout the history of the church have always done so much harm. Yeah. because of the grandeur of the mission. I mean, it's an inconceivable mission to share in Christ's own mission of sanctifying souls. And that requires holiness of life. And where that holiness of life is lacking, right, the church's mission gravely suffers. But the sacraments that he administers are all still valid. Right, so this is why so I teach in a seminary. And so, so much of our our hope, our prayer, our work is human formation, spiritual formation, not just intellectual formation, so that they can um, do their ministry with holiness of, of life and witness. Okay, and um, another question. Would you please go over once again why we call a priest father? Great. Um, so it's a kind of analogy to... Um, the spiritual life to our natural life. And so in our natural life, we receive our natural life from our parents. Where do we receive our supernatural life? And, and so we receive it from God, God our Father, but we receive it through the mediation of the church's ministers. Right? And so um, the priest or deacon who, all right, we don't say deacon father, but um, a deacon can also baptize, but um, it's through the, the ministering the sacraments in general that a priest um, works out 
spiritual paternity, right, which is a beautiful thing. So priests are very profoundly fathers. So there's a line from St. Paul um, where he speaks about God the Father as the source of all paternity in heaven and in earth. And what's so beautiful is that in the church, the whole church is mother. Right? So we speak of Holy Mother Church. But the church is, and the church is mother because we're her sons and daughters. Right? And so the, the whole life of the church is a continual life of engendering um, divine life in us. But the priest, because he's acting in the person of Christ, shares in that uh, engendering in a unique way. Right? And so the priest um, exercises in a very profound way spiritual paternity. All of us are called to do it, right? Um, in this maternity, so in the church, everyone is called to be a parent, as it were. So spiritual paternity for men and spiritual maternity for women. But again, the priest does it in a special way through administering the other sacraments. Right? And so that's why he's in a unique way said to be father. And so what even though he, he's in the son, son is the image of the father, and the father works through the son. And so by being um, imprinted with Christ in that new way in holy orders, um, the priest um, becomes our father in the order of grace in a unique way. And that will be his sanctification. So again, this is, has huge ramifications in seminary formation. So at the seminary, we're always talking about them. Um, forming the men in spiritual paternity, that they're not to think of their priestly ministry as celibate bachelorhood, right? But as profound, I mean, they're called to be fathers. And that's really the defining um, element of priestly spirituality. Yeah, great question. And so that's the glory of the priest. And again, it shows the difference between the spiritual and the natural orders, that, or the, the supernatural and the natural orders. In the natural order, we can't be fathers to that many, right? But what's beautiful about the supernatural order is that fertility, fecundity, is enlarged. And so a priest, even though he's renouncing biological paternity, um, can have a huge supernatural paternity. But again, it's also true for the lay faithful in our common priesthood. Second half of the question, under what conditions can a priest leave his, I mean, again, it's tragic. It can happen that through um, a canonical um, crime of, of um, one sort or other, a priest loses the, um, the suitability of continuing to exercise his ministry and can be um, deprived of that. So that's what's meant by the term laicization, even though he remains a priest forever. And there can be other reasons as well. And so one could be dispensed from exercising, but he still always retains the um, priestly character and therefore the power in an emergency to hear someone's confession. And so any priest um, can always, in, in danger of death, hear any uh, confession of the faithful. Any other questions? Uh huh. Angie? Can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I, um, this week, when I was in my holy hours, I was reading, I'm, I'm reading the Torah. Mm -hmm. And um, there were some things that you said that made me think about some things that I read this week. Uh, a few things that were very, um, very interesting that um, when um, the people of Israel made the golden calf when Moses was up on the mountain and they had, um, they, they complained to Aaron that, um, anyway, they made the golden calf when Moses came down the mountain and saw the golden calf and he got very mad and he asked Aaron, why did you do this? Why did you allow this? And um, anyway, after Aaron explained, Moses, called out to, the, to all of the Israelites, let him who is for the Lord come to me now. And it was the Levites, the Levites that came. And that's when the Levites became precious to the Lord because they, they chose to 
do what was right and to come to what was good and to turn away from what everybody else was doing. And that was when the Levites became holy. And I, I had never, I, did, I didn't know that. So I just thought that was really neat. Mm -hmm. And um, did you know that? Yeah, so in, before that time, the, uh -huh. it would be the, um, the patriarchs were priests simply by being the, um, the head of the family. Uh -huh. At the golden calf, right, precisely the, as you described so well, um, the priesthood was given to a particular tribe in Israel, uh -huh. the, the tribe of Levi, who now had the Lord as their inheritance. So of all the tribes, they didn't get a particular territory. Right. But because before their that, part yeah. is the Lord's. Yeah, but before that, the reason why they were chosen was because when Moses mm -hmm. called out, yeah. let him who is for the Lord come to me, right after they had built the calf, when Moses was mad about the golden calf, it was the Levites that mm -hmm. came, and that's oh. when they were dedicated to the Lord as called out and special to the Lord, and they followed the command, I, I believe, to actually murder part of their family at that time. I'm not saying that that was good, but right. they, the point was that they followed the command of the Lord, and they mm -hmm. turned from what they had done wrong, and because of that, they were made holy to the Lord that day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so that's, that's a type of holy orders in the new covenant. Mm -hmm. orders. But there, again, it's interesting to look at the continuity and the difference. So the, the continuity, again, is that it's a people set apart. Um, one tribe, their port is, portion is the Lord's. But the difference is that that was hereditary, right? It belonged in that family forever after that event. Whereas mm -hmm. in, in the church, it's by way of um, a charism, a special calling and vocation. Mm -hmm. But some, 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 sometimes in the Old Testament, things can be taught to us, you know, that mm -hmm. uh, things speak out in the way that we can learn in the New Testament um, about Jesus and about mm -hmm. God the Father. Um, and I had never known that. Mm -hmm. And I, I remembered reading that this week, and I thought you might like to know yeah, it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Todd? Yeah, this isn't so much a question, but uh, I thought it was good your point about the mission of the laity and your point about how much we all, in varying degrees, depending on our life, you know, dedicate ourselves to our professions or obtaining professional expertises and things like that. It's sort of, you know, it's sort of a, it's sort of a shame, you know, sort of a shame, you know, like we should be ashamed in the sense that why aren't we doing that about our most important mission? And there's another thing I've often reflected on that even is more, I'm not trying to just get into shame, but it's simply a fact that the people, including myself in my own life quite a bit, are often extremely passionate and informed about their hobbies. Yeah. Their hobbies. People, including myself, have been in great in depth in their hobbies and very passionate, will bring it up to people, sort of get people into their hobbies. And yet, the most important mission in our life, are we that passionate about that? Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, we need hobbies, I think, for mental sanity. But, um, but that, that always be um, a kind of an examination of conscience, right? Yeah. Am I, that, that mental relaxation, is it in the Lord? And yeah. am I passionate enough about, or even aware, right, of this glorious mission? And I also like your point about, in, 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 in Lumen Gentium, I guess, point about dedicating our ordinary things as part of our mission, which is really just the idea of like joining everything to Christ. Mm -hmm. Everything. So. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So we, on that note, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we give you thanks so much for these and all thy gifts. Through Christ our Lord, and the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So our next talk is two weeks on, and we'll look at the other four sacraments, and we'll look at this intermediate level sacramental character that we've been seeing in Baptism, Confirmation, Eucharist. I'm sorry, Baptism, Confirmation, Holy Orders. We'll look at it in the other four sacraments. There is a, another question here, just came in. Should I do it? How does annulment fit in with the indelible character of marriage? Um, it does actually. So an annulment isn't a divorce. 
It's just simply recognizing that the sacrament never had, was valid in the first place. And so it's another example of precisely this doctrine. There's this difference though, that matrimony um, isn't indelible because a spouse can die. And so it's, it lasts as long as the spouses are living. 